I'm absolutely delighted to be here to talk about a trading uh, nation, options for the United Kingdom in or out of the EU, because I think it's a very obviously appropriate uh, subject to kick off with. And as a trading nation, what should Britain's response be in particular to the changing global economy? In 1980, the EU 28 share of world GDP was over 30% in purchasing power parity terms. Uh, by uh, 2014, it was actually just about 17%. And if the IMF is uh, correct in its forecasts, and it may not be, but let's assume that they are going to be as good as anybody, that uh, by 2020, the EU share will be about 15%, very much in line with the EU's, with the US's, lower than, smaller than the Commonwealth, smaller than NAFTA, and smaller than China. Although, given China's current problems, uh, China may not grow quite as quickly as the IMF seem to think so. But I think in order to uh, fully uh, uh, benefit from the changing global economy, the world needs a, the, the UK needs a much looser relationship with the European Union, a much looser relationship. We need to be able to do this in order to really trade much more satisfactorily than we do at the moment. And in particular, I think there are three things that we should be looking for. We should be able to repeal or amend some of the EU regulations that we've just heard about, um, especially the, some of the social and employment regulations. Of course, when you're in the EU, you simply cannot do that. And fortune favours the flexible. I think the second thing you need to do is uh, Britain should be able to negotiate its own trade deals with its favoured trading partners. And as a member of the EU's customs union, again, you cannot do this. And I'll come on to the trading uh, relationship in, in a couple of minutes. And the third thing is, and I'm not getting anywhere near the current uh, migration problems, but if we, uh, we need to have a non-discriminatory immigration uh, policy that doesn't discriminate between the EU and non-EU citizens, it's really a matter of Britain becoming more of a global partner than a European partner. It's a bit of a change of emphasis, if you like. Now, we've already heard that uh, David Cameron will be trying to negotiate our relationship, and good luck to him. Let's see what he can actually achieve. But if he doesn't manage to achieve anything very fundamental, I personally believe there's nothing to fear from leaving the EU, and I do believe there's actually quite a lot to gain, as I say, not least of all in terms of regulations, in terms of trade, trade negotiations, and in terms of a non-discriminatory immigration uh, uh, policy. Well, having said that, if we did leave, what would the options be? And obviously, there's a lot of debate about this. Uh, well, the first thing to say is that if Brexit, then the trading under the WTO, the World Trade Organization, rules would be the default position. We would not be left to sort of float and sink in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, as I've heard some people say. No, we are still a member of the WTO, but what we would do, we would resume all the full rights and responsibilities of WTO membership and trade under those rules on trade and uh, tariffs. The second thing to say is, if you're in the, um, under the WTO, is that, of course, outside the EU, you would face the European Union's common external tariff. Now, unless, of course, there's some free trade deal, which I'll come on to in a minute. But according to the House of Commons, uh, the com common uh, external tariff at the moment only averages about 1%. And, uh, of course, about 40% of our exports is actually services. I was going, I was going to say not least of all maritime services. And, of course, they don't attract tariffs at all. Uh, but there are some industries, like the car industry, which would not wish to face a common external tariff of, say, nearly 10%. I think the third thing to say is that uh, it isn't as if trading under the WTO rules uh, without being part of a trade agreement is particularly unusual. Uh, Richard Baldwin, who is an expert on trade, has estimated that about a third of the trade of global trade is actually under the WTO rules without any other particular agreements. And of course, those agreements include free trade agreements, where you have no internal tariff, but you can choose your own external tariff, and customs unions, where you have no internal tariff, but you have a common external tariff, and of course the EU is a customs union. And the other point that Richard Baldwin would make is that, as uh, tariffs generally been falling, that the benefits of actually being in free trade agreements of various types, of preferential trade agreements of various types, is actually diminishing. And I think the fourth thing to say, I would like to say about 
the WTO rules, is that um, it doesn't stop trade if you're not in the EU. And I find it very interesting, looking at China, is that over the last decade, our exports to China have pretty well gone up fivefold. Uh, they've gone up nearly 400%. Whereas our trade to the European Union has only gone up about 50%. And of course, what that tells you is that trade is driven by commercial factors, is driven by growth opportunities, is driven by all these pull factors, and not just being a member of a block. So in conclusion, uh, the WTO, I think, is an attractive option. I think it's a feasible option. It's the default option. And in many cases, it's been a successful option for many trading nations. But I would say that I think we can do a tad better than that. Because in addition to the uh, WTO sort of bedrock, if you like, uh, for, for trade, I would expect and would like uh, Britain to start negotiating free trade agreements with its favoured partners. And Britain would be in a very, very good condition, a good, good situation to do that, because it is, in fact, a major um, import market or export market, shall I say, for a lot of the trading nations of the world. And uh, this idea that somehow we're too small to negotiate our, our trade agreements, I think, is frankly bizarre. Um, Iceland, by the way, has just negotiated and completed a deal with China. Now, rumour has it that Iceland is really rather a small country and China is really quite a big one. But there we go. And also, I think if we did our own trade agreements, they'd be subject to less delay and dilution than is the current the case when the EU uh, negotiates such things. Uh, as far as I can see, the US-EU uh, TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, seems to be going on forever. And I would say there are three particular groups of uh, countries that I'd like the United Kingdom to consider trade deals with. Uh, first and foremost, of course, would be the EU itself. And this, uh, and I think that, uh, that the EU partners would be more than keen to consider this, uh, not least of all because we have a whacking great trade deficit with them. I think last year, speaking from memory, uh, the goods deficit was something like £77 billion. Pounds. And the goods deficit with Germany alone was £30 billion. Now, 30 billion is quite a considerable sum of money, even for the German economy, and certainly for German exporters. Under no circumstances would they wish that uh, EU, uh, that UK German trade to be disrupted in any particular way. And uh, I, I just uh, another thing that's worth thinking about is uh, back to Germany, and Germany is absolutely crucial in all this, is that we are Germany's second biggest export market after France. And over the last few years, whereas uh, the fr exports, German exports to France have actually been stagnant, if not come off a tad, um, the German exports to the United Kingdom have been growing quite nicely, thank you. No, I don't think Germany would want that trade to be disrupted at all. And the second uh, group of countries that I would like to see the United Kingdom consider having trade agreements with would be those countries that already have free trade agreements with the EU. And indeed, you could use the current trade agreements as templates uh, for a UK uh, third party trade agreement. And these countries include countries like uh, Korea and Chile and Mexico, um, which, to be honest with you, with possible exception of Korea, are not our major trading partners. But you know, the templates are there, so you just may as well take, make, uh, take the benefit of them. And the third group of countries, uh, which I think are much, much more important, are those countries that currently do not have um, uh, trade agreements at the moment with the EU. Uh, I've just mentioned the US uh, TTIP. Well, that seems to be struggling along, as I say. I would have thought the UK and the US would have been able to uh, finalise something much quicker than that's going on at the moment. And after all, the US is our biggest single trading partner. And moreover, we do actually have a surplus with it, which is rather nice. And I was going to say rather unusual, but there you go. A um, lot of Commonwealth countries that at the moment do not have trading agreements uh, with the EU. I would like to see the United Kingdom develop ties, more ties with them, Australia, New Zealand. Canada, there has been an agreement uh, with Canada, but it's not yet been enacted. 
Uh, I would like to see trade agreements with India, which are stalled, with Malaysia. And outside the Commonwealth, other countries are worth considering, of course, Japan and China, where talks really have only just begun. You know, the world is your oyster. I don't need to tell you that, as your shipping people. And I would like, just like to see Britain look beyond Europe uh, into the wider world, but still have very good trading relationships with the European Union, but why shouldn't it? In addition to having uh, free trade agreements uh, on top of the WTO uh, agreement, uh, I think Britain too should reconsider, or consider, should I say, rejoining EFTA, um, the European Free Trade uh, uh, Association, which we were a founding member of, uh, which I faintly remember being a founding member of. But there again, I fa faintly remember the coronation as well, so I'm quite old. But if, if we were to leave the EU, really, we should consider this, uh, because it's not just that uh, those four countries and our, our rich countries, two of them are actually quite sizable uh, countries, Norway and Switzerland. And for Norway, of course, they have a working great trade surplus with us, not least of all because of natural gas. Um, of course, the EFTA, the EFTA countries would have to agree to that, but on the whole, it would be surely in their trading in interests so to do. And it, if we did rejoin EFTA, then it wouldn't just be those four countries that you could trade with, but EFTA itself has negotiated all sorts of free trade agreements with third countries. In fact, uh, some experts take the view that the um, EFTA's network of trade agreements is, is more impressive than the EU's. And provided the third countries in question were agreeable, then as an EFTA member, the United Kingdom would have access to those agreements as well. So it really sounds really quite, uh, quite, uh, quite, quite, quite a good idea, in my opinion. And in fact, I would say that the best option for Britain, WTO plus free trade agreements plus joining EFTA. And in my final few comments, because I know we're short of time, um, I would... Uh, have reservations about two other options that are sometimes mooted. The first one is the Turkish option, which is essentially staying in the EU's customs union. And uh, Turkey is a member of the customs union, although, of course, it's never got much further in its membership of the European Union. But uh, as I've uh, suggested within a customs union, you cannot negotiate your own trade deals. And I think one of the major reasons for leaving the EU would be to just do that. And uh, the second one is what is known as, I suppose, affectionately as the Norwegian option. Uh, in other words, being a member of the EEA, the European Economic Area, which, of course, we are a member at the moment, well, we're a member of it at the moment, uh, by virtue of the fact that we are a member of the EU. If we left the EU, we would leave the EEA. I don't think there's any doubt about that. We would leave the EEA. So if we wanted the Norwegian option of being in the EEA, we would have to reapply. And of course, that would give access to the so-called single market in goods and services and capital and labor. But um, there are big disadvantages, in my view, uh, of uh, being in the uh, EEA. The first is, of course, you cannot, cannot repeal or amend unilaterally any of the EU's regulations on the social employment policies. Um, the second thing is that you wouldn't be able to have your own non-discriminatory immigration policy, which I do think, in a global world, this country should be looking for. Uh, but there are advantages. You would be able to negotiate your own trade deals. You wouldn't be in the customs union. And, of course, you'd be outside the common fisheries policy and the common agricultural policy. But I think just a final comment on the single market. Much is made of the single market, um, how frightfully important it is. Well, trade is important. Trading with Europe is important. But as I showed from my statistics were with China, you don't actually have to be in the single market to trade with the EU. I think that is something of a red herring. But all in all, if, as I say, the, uh, the Prime Minister does not come back with a major negotiation, I don't think, to repeat a point, I don't think there's anything to fear from leaving Brexit. I'm very, very optimistic about this country. I think it's got a terrific future, and I think it would actually have a better future <laughs> if it left the EU.